Well, hi, everyone. Um, I'll give everybody a few seconds to join. I um, invite you to open up the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. I'm here in Albany, New York. Harrison in Syracuse, New York. Naples, Florida. Nice. Buffalo. I'm going to try this. Kilmarnock, Virginia. Oxford and New Haven, Connecticut. Ithaca. Guilford, Connecticut, New York City. Like George, a neighbor, Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. It's Valley Stream, Brooklyn. Hi, Mom. Well, hello um, and welcome to the holiday edition of our webinar uh, series. Uh, my name is Rich Merritt and I'll be your host today. Um, this webinar series is brought to you by the Audubon State Offices of Connecticut, New York, whose mission it is to protect birds and the places we all need in our forests, on our coasts, which we'll talk about today, and across local communities. Um, uh, I'll let you know that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available soon on our YouTube and Facebook pages of Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York, probably by the end of the week. Um, and questions are welcome here in the chat box at any time. And we will have time for question and answers uh, at the end. Um, today's webinar is on the conservation of that beautiful little salt marsh sparrow. And to introduce our speaker is my friend and colleague, Jillian Liner the Director of Conservation um, for Audubon New York. Jillian has been with Audubon for more than 20 years and has been um, spearheading Audubon New York's priority salt marsh work for quite a few years now. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Jillian to introduce our speaker. Jillian. Thanks, Rich. Hello, everyone. I am so happy to be able to introduce you all to Amy Weldon. Amy is the coordinator of the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture, which is a regional partnership that collaborates to restore and sustain native bird populations and habitats throughout the ACJV region, which extends from up in Maine all the way down to Florida and includes Puerto Rico. <clears throat> the partnership is currently focused on one of the most imperiled habitats in the region and that is coastal marshes and the suite of vulnerable birds that depend on them like this cute one here in the, in the photo. That Coastal marshes and the protection of, of the species that depend on them is also one of Audubon's highest priorities. So we're thrilled to have Jamie, Amy here with us today. And Amy joined the ACJV back in 2016 and she's based in Hadley, Massachusetts. In her role, she's responsible for guiding the strategic vision of the joint venture. And she also coordinates the many efforts of the partnership to move the needle on priority species conservation. Prior to joining the ACJV, she directed the land protection and habitat restoration activities at the Potomac Conservancy. And she authored Conserving Habitat through the Federal Farm Bill, a guide for land trusts and landowners. And she's held wildlife leadership positions at Defenders of Wildlife and also at Audubon. She used to coordinate Virginia's Important Bird Area Program. She has her master's degree in ecology from North Carolina State University and her bachelor's degree in biology from the College of St. Benedict in Minnesota. We have been working with Amy and her colleague, Mitch Hartley, who is also has Audubon ties. Mitch used to work with me at Audubon New York. Uh, we've been collaborating with them for the past few years as Audubon has expanded our coast program in New York and Connecticut to address the needs of the salt marsh barrow and improve coastal resiliency for birds and people. Um, we highly value your partnership, and we can't wait to hear more about the incredible work of the ACJV. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. Um, looking forward to having the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what I think is an amazing little bird in a highly complex and amazing habitat system. Um, as Jillian mentioned, I work for the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture, and this is a map that shows the boundaries of the joint venture. Um, everything within that green area is the area where we work within. And the way we work is through partnerships. And so the, the joint venture is made up of a massive partnership that includes state, federal, NGO, and academic partners, and everything in between. And um, all of uh, these partners are collectively working toward the um, advancement of bird conservation on the ground for native birds. And every single one of the joint ventures, which there are 21 additional joint ventures across the country. So they basically have wall-to-wall -wall coverage across most of North America, down into Mexico and all the way up through Canada. 
and each joint venture is different. We all decide what we want to work on within the joint venture based on the highest priority conservation challenges and species within that joint venture. Our joint venture is one of the biggest joint ventures, um, has 16 states and territories within it and habitats that range everything from mangrove swamps all the way up to boreal forests in, in Maine. And so we really had to be very strategic about how we chose our conservation priorities so that we could really really have a measurable impact in moving the conservation needle on something. And that's something that we decided on that best represents the entire joint venture is coastal salt marshes and, and other marsh habitats within the coast. And we, we chose this because almost every state within the joint venture has some coastal marsh habitat. Um, and also this habitat is uh, one of the most imperiled habitats across the entire joint venture area. So a really critical habitat to protect. Um, and then to represent that system and the entire ge geography of the joint venture, we wanted to select a few flagship species that best represent that coastal system and then concentrate our, our conservation toward those flagship species. So we have three, um, the black duck, the black rail and the salt marsh sparrow. And so today I'll be focusing specifically on the salt marsh sparrow. And so first of all, why salt marsh habitat in the first place? Like, you know, yes, we have salt marsh in most all of our, most all of our JV states and it is one of the most imperiled habitats, but it's also one of the most important habitats for a whole lot of reasons. Um, the, the estuary system is a system that occupies about 4% of the total landscape in the country, but it supports 40% of the people. And that area also supports nearly half of the economy that comes from that estuary coastal system. So these are really critical systems for people as well as wildlife. They, are the first line of defense, of natural defense for coastal communities um, with for hurricanes and other severe storms, which as we all know are becoming more and more common. And there was a study after um, Hurricane Sandy did so much damage, and this picture is actually a picture of a town in New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy, and you can see all the flooding. Um, and this study showed that the areas that had marshes fared much better than the areas that didn't have marshes. And they calculated that marshes overall present, prevented more than $625 billion in damages to private property. So they're pretty much free protection for coastal communities and make one heck of a good investment if you restore those salt marshes because every dollar that you invest in restoring salt marshes in coastal systems results in a $6 return in cost savings and reduction in human harm. So really important system. They also have really, really significant carbon sequestration value. Um, we call these, um, the carbon that's sequestered in these marine and coastal environments, blue carbon. Um, and the, the, the co coastal salt marsh system can capture carbon at rates 10 to 50 times greater than forests. So you need 50 acres of forest to equal one acre of salt marsh. And you can see here in this um, bar graph taken from a, a um, paper that, that I reviewed recently that shows the rates of tropical forests compared to coastal salt marsh system. And they're in this particular instance, 50 times greater. And the carbon that is in those systems is stored there for millennia. So literally thousands of years versus carbon in terrestrial forest systems that is stored generally only for decades or a hundred years or hundreds of years at the most. And that's because that kind of carbon is constantly cycling as vegetation is, is decomposing, released back into the environment and taken up again versus these salt marsh systems where they just capture sediment and it is buried in an anaerobic environment. It can be six meters thick in some places and it just stays there for thousands of years if it's not disturbed. And this area also has a tremendous value for fisheries. Um, this is part of that economics figure that I just presented a couple of slides ago that it, a multi-million dollar fishery is supported that um, nursery habitat and salt marsh systems that support 75% of the commercial fish and shellfish harvest out there. So super critical habitat, like no doubt this is an important habitat to protect. And then we, why did we select the salt marsh sparrow as our, as our species out of all the other species that are in this um, salt marsh system? 
Um, well, number one is that this is a bird that's endemic to the coastal marshes of the eastern United States. It's the only bird that's endemic to the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture region. And that means basically that it is found nowhere else in the world. Its entire global population is here in the United States on the Atlantic and Florida Gulf Coast. And they breed only for Virginia north to Maine. Um, not even found in Canada. So we have 100% of the global responsibility for conserving this species. It breeds also exclusively in what we call high marsh habitat. So I have this little schematic here that shows the different habitat types within the salt marsh system. And so you have the low marsh habitat and that's the, the, the marsh that's flooded every day, twice a day on, high, on the high tides. And then a little further up in elevation, you have what we call the high marsh habitat. And this is the habitat that floods only once or twice a month on the new and the full moons. So infrequently flooded marsh habitat, and then the transition zone and up into the uplands. And so this high marsh area here is the most imperiled marsh habitat because it cannot get wetter and still be high marsh. Um, and, and that is what we're seeing with sea level rise is these marshes are getting wetter and then they transition to low marsh habitat. And with that transition, you lose the habitat that's available for um, specialist species like the salt marsh sparrow. And also the salt marsh sparrow is the best representative of the entire tidal marsh specialist um, uh, group. And there was a, some work by the University of Connecticut that evaluated the different tidal marsh specialists and determined whether, well, if we did conservation just for this species, how many other species could we carry with it? Or if we did the whole collection of species or, or groups of species, how many, how many of the conservation needs of the individual species would be met? And what they found is that focusing conservation efforts on the salt marsh sparrow is the best way to meet the conservation needs of the entire, entire tidal marsh specialist group. So that's yet another good reason to focus on the salt marsh sparrow as our flagship because it represents all these other values that um, we just talked about from wildlife to people, economics, and carbon. And if all that isn't reason enough to care about this bird, it's just a really cool bird. And I knew nothing about the salt marsh sparrow or coastal marshes when I started with the joint venture. And the more I learned, the more I realized just how amazing this little bird is. It is perfectly adapted to tidal systems. Um, and it has a whole lot of different adaptations that make it perfect for that. And one is that it has this unique breeding system where there's None of the birds have territories. They all just arrive and they start breeding. They can have nests within feet of each other. It does not bother them at all. They have no pair bonds. Nobody connects for you know any period of time. No one defends anybody else, which is also a good adaptation in a system that's hard to defend. Um, and there's a higher rate of female multiple mating in the salt marsh sparrow than of any other bird species. So they they're really are kind of functioning in many ways as a single entity, not as individuals. And they have this amazing synchronous nesting with the lunar cycle, which I'll show you here in this figure. So to give you a little interpretation of what you're looking at here, this is a map of, so a graph of the high tide height here on the left on the Y. And then on the right is time. Um, and you can see that the lunar phase is associated with it. So starting, with the full moon here and then moving to the new moon in the middle and the full moon on the, on the other side. And so with each of those full and new moons, you have a peak um, flooding tide and they call these spring tides. So there's a peak flooding tide on both of those full moons and then another one that's not quite as high in the new moon. So these are where the highest flooding risk are. And so through evolution over time, the salt marsh sparrow has adapted to placing its nest right about here. So it's right above mean high water level for those tides so that it can escape those tides. And what happens is that all the birds arrive at the same time on the breeding grounds and they immediately all begin nesting. They all build their nests and then this spring tide comes and wipes out all the nests or most of the nests anyway and floods all the nests out. And so as soon as that spring tide is over, everybody scrambles around and re-nests immediately and then after that, they cross their fingers and just hope that they can get through this 24 to 26 day egg laying incubation and chick rearing phase to fledge a successful nest. 
And so, you know, there can be any number of tides within here from storms and whatnot that can cause those nests to flood. And they are actually adapted to flooding in a really amazing way that I'm going to show you in a second. So their nest period is almost exactly timed to the lunar cycle so that they can squeeze this in between those two, those two peak tides, which is pretty amazing. They also have um, nest adaptations that make them pretty cool. So this habitat here in the background is Spartina patens, otherwise known as salt meadow hay. And this is the uh, classic salt marsh sparrow habitat grass that they nest in. You can see it's kind of whirled and falling apart or falling over and making little tussocks and stuff. They'll nest in those little whorls, which is this picture here. And that nest is deep in there where you can't really see it. And the nest is sitting on a thick layer of thatch that elevates that nest a few inches off the ground. So they're not right on the ground. They're, they're a little above it. And then they build this canopy of grasses that goes over the nest, which serves both to hide it from predators, but also as protection and against um, flooding events, which I'm going to show you here if I can get this video to work, which I tested it and it should, um, is a pretty fascinating little two minute section of video here. Um, and actually, I have my bar here in the way and trying to figure out, there we go. All right. disaster. A female sparrow has no way to get her eggs back into the nest if they float away. That's why the nest is constructed with an overhanging dome to make sure the eggs stay put. As long as they remain within the confines of the nest, they can bob around for an hour or two until the tide recedes. When mum returns, she'll warm them up and they'll continue to incubate. After the eggs hatch, the chicks have no protective shell to float around in, so they're more vulnerable than ever. Young chicks can't swim. They're defenseless against the rising water. But once they're about five days old, they're strong enough to climb up above a flooded nest and wait out the tide. This chick has made it through the night. She was just big enough to reach safety. Her siblings weren't so lucky. So that just is, I think, a perfect video to show the really amazing adaptations that this sparrow has for tidal flooding. And there has been research on this that shows that some nests can be flooded 10 times and then still be successful at the end because if the floods hit at the right time and those eggs stay in the nest, they can be rewarmed up and incubated by the female. Or if those nestlings are old enough, some of them can crawl up out of the nest. But if they get flooded when the nestlings are too young or if the eggs float out of the nest, that's when, they, um, that's when there's trouble. And so what's happening here under a sea level rise scenario is that the tides are getting higher and what is resulting from that and the storms are getting more frequent. And so what's resulting from that is probably not so much of an impact here, but you'll see this flooding event from the new moon here, sometimes it's the full moon, which always was fairly safely below the nest height is now 
above the nest height. And so this is now becoming a high flooding risk threat during the incubation um, and nestling stage. So, and the one here on the end too is also one that could be more of a risk. And so what's happening is that we're seeing these major population declines due to nest flooding. And that is the primary driver of population loss in the salt marsh sparrow is nest flooding. As you can see from this really sad picture of a flooded nest full of nestlings who at the time are still alive, but I don't think this nest made it. Um, so over the last you know, 20 or 30 years, there's been a more than 87% decline in the salt marsh sparrow population. And that's largely due to the sea level um, flooding. Um, the sea level rise in this area is two to four times the global average um, in, here in the Northeast. And there's also more frequent storms. So it's not just those, those um, predictable tide flooding events, it's actually more storms as well. And what's also an uh, important factor is that the, hum the human alterations to the marsh are exacerbating the effects of sea level rise. So these are three different images of what we have done to the marsh. There's, um, you know, 90% of the marshes from Virginia to Maine have been ditched. So there's almost no pristine marshes any anymore in the Northeast. This picture up here in the, in the upper right is what they call AMWAM, open water marsh management, which was a mosquito con is a mosquito control practice where they create pools to um, uh, attract fish to eat mosquito larvae. And then what happens in these ditched and altered, you can see AMWAM here as well as the ditching. What happens is that when the sea level rises or when the tides come in, they go over the berms of the ditches they leave a, some of the sediment along the edge of the ditch. So you end up with a little bit of a higher area along those ditches. Then the water goes over that high area and gets stuck in between the ditches. So you end up with those areas in between ditches converting to open water. And you get this pattern that has been um, dubbed waffle maple syrup flooding, where it looks like a waffle filled with maple syrup on, in the depressions in between the high parts of the ditches. And all of that is causing. Um, like the kind of runaway pool formation and the loss of this marsh habitat. And so what we're seeing then is this 9% annual decline of sparrows. We are here in 2021 at about 25,000 birds. And we want to stay at 25,000 birds. That's our goal. That's the goal the joint venture has set. And what we really want to avoid is getting down as far as what we're calling a critical minimum of 10,000 birds. And that's where you really get into um, into a, a threat of extinction at this point. So we're trying to keep the population here and that is going to require um, solving the problem between now and 2033 or so, the next 10 years, we need to figure out how to make sure we don't get to this critical minimum of 10,000 and then turning that ship around so that we can get back up to 25,000 birds, which um, probably is most likely at this 2.5% annual growth rate which would get us there in about, at about 2070. So how do we get there? Well, it's really simple. You figure out where to work, you figure out what to do there, you find the resources to do the work, and then you do the work, except that it's not that simple. It's actually um, pretty complicated in these systems where we're dealing with a novel threat of sea level rise. You're not gonna stop the threat, so that's not on the table. You can only figure out how to build the resiliency of the marsh system to adapt to the threat. And so the first thing that we did within the joint venture is figured out what it would take on the ground to meet that goal of 25,000 birds. And so we set acreage goals for the short term to avoid that you know, 10,000 bird goal or that 10,000 bird um, lower limit. We wanna make sure we don't get there. So that means we need to get 23,000 acres of high, marsh, high quality high marsh habitat on the ground before 2030. And then if we're gonna turn that ship and grow the population back up again, we need a total of almost 80,000 80, acres of, of high quality habitat on the ground and, and broken out by right now the current distribution of salt marsh sparrows across the landscape. What percentage of the population do each of these states support? That's the percentage of the acreage goal that they've been given. And we also developed a tool that's going to help identify those marshes within the um, breeding range, since that's where the main threat is, is the breeding range. We're focusing almost all of our energy there um, that have the characteristics of high quality high marsh habitat that have that are the most resilient marshes with the least amount of 
of alterations and um, the right kind of habitat. So this is the um, a screenshot of our salt marsh sparrow habitat tool, which you can find on our website if you're interested in looking at your own state. And then since those areas are pretty big, especially in the mid-Atlantic, up in um, Long Island, in the Northeast, not, not as much um, big patches like that, but there's you know 10,000 acre patches in this area in the mid-Atlantic. And so if in order to be more strategic, we needed to figure out how to step those marshes down. And so we formed a number of working groups in each state to identify the highest priority patches from this tool and look at each of those marshes and figure out what needs to be done in those marshes and create kind of an individualized conservation plan for each state. And so what do we do when we get there? Well, number one, you need to restore and enhance or create what we call high quality high marsh habitat. And that's not just high marsh habitat. It's high marsh habitat that's capable of supporting population growth. So right now there's plenty of high marsh habitat out there, but it's flooding too much. And so we need to create high marsh habitat that doesn't flood so much that, you, that these birds can't get a nest out. And then we also need to plan for the future. We need to protect the highest priority marsh migration corridors that are out there so that we have a place for marshes to go in the future. And the, there's a handful of priority management actions that we are recommending for most of the marshes that are out there. This is by no means all of the things that can be done to build resiliency in a marsh, but these are the most common ones. And I'm gonna run through each of those one by one. Um, so this first one is ditch remediation. Um, this is one that uh, we've done quite a bit of, our partners have done quite a bit of in, in the Northeast. It basically in, entails cutting the high marsh um, vegetation after the breeding season is over. And you can see these guys over here, they've got um, leaf blowers and they're blowing and rolling that grass into some of these, into strategically selected ditches. And then this middle picture, you can see they've got twine that's holding down that natural vegetation to keep it from floating away when the water rises during the tides. And over time with reapplications of this, you slowly build the elevation in the bottom of the marsh up until you get to this point on the right where natural vegetation is able to take root and start growing. And then that traps even more sediment and allows the, the elevation to increase even, even at a faster pace. So um, you can see that the grass that's growing in here looks a little different from the grass that you see up here. That's because this is low marsh grass and this is high marsh grasses. So this elevation here is still too low to support the high marsh vegetation that sparrows need, but eventually it will get up to that point and then you'll have a more healed marsh. Runneling is another big one that's been done a lot in um, Rhode Island, especially Connecticut, some of the other New England states. And this is a pretty simple concept. It's basically digging a very shallow um, ditch, like a micro ditch. And the point of that ditch is to drain an area that is unnaturally ponded due to sea level rise and to give it a chance to regrow that vegetation back. So this is all the same marsh. You can kind of see this tree line is the same across these systems. And this is what it looked like when they started. They dug a little runnel here in this pretty degraded um, converting to open water system. And this is what it looks like after it drained out that first year. And this is what it looks like with the vegetation regrowing. And you can see up here, there's a little bit of Peyton's vegetation growing, which is the type of vegetation that we're shooting for. And then elevation enhancement. This is basically taking dredged material sediment um, that is, that is um, dredged from different nearby sources for channel dredging and um, waterway passage. And instead of dumping that out to, in, to the, into the open ocean, which is often what happens with dredge material. Um, we're working in several places on getting that dredge material put back onto the marsh where it came from. So keeping the sediment in the system. And that can range from just a couple um, inches of sediment across the marsh to maintain elevation over time. Or in the case of this project here, which is from Rhode Island, um, the middle two pictures, they've actually put more than a foot of sediment on this marsh because the marsh was pretty much lost. It was way too low to, to be able to support the right kind of vegetation. And the only way to get it back up to the place where it could be resilient was to pretty much kill the marsh um, with a foot of sediment. And then now the marsh will um, regrow on top of that. It looks pretty barren right now, but you'd be surprised how quickly the marsh vegetation takes root and starts expanding. And then the last one here is facilitated marsh migration. 
And um, these are areas in the mid-Atlantic. These are from Maryland specifically, where you're seeing the marsh vegetation creep up into what used to be the upland forest. And so all these trees have died. They're, they're called, we call them ghost forests because they tend to bleach out pretty white and, and are just kind of skeletons standing in the marsh. And in this case here on the left, it looks like the process of conversion in, of the right kind of vegetation is actually happening as it should. And to make this area um, suitable for salt marsh sparrows, you might consider cutting out these trees. They don't recognize trees as habitat. Um, so you could cut out those trees and see if you could create more um, um, attractive habitat for salt marsh sparrows. That has not really been tried very much yet, but we're hoping to get more folks doing that kind of work. And then the picture on the right here is the more likely scenario that these areas where the trees die are a little bit less saline and a little higher. So they are perfect growing grounds for invasive common reed or otherwise known as Phragmites. So one thing that people could consider doing is managing the Phragmites in these marsh transition zones so that they look more like the picture on the left and get a toehold for that good marsh vegetation instead of complete dominance by Phragmites and then nothing um, can grow there and it's, it's non-habitat. So those are just a handful of some of the uh, management projects that people are doing on the ground. Um, we don't have all of those projects captured. There's literally so many going on right now across different partners. Um, but we are having, we are um, asking people to put them into the project, this project inventory whenever they can. So you can, this is available online. You can get the link on our website um, and you can check out, you can click on each of these little bird links, which is an individual project. You can read about those projects. And then this is like the rolled up information here. How many projects are in there? Where are we in our progress toward our goal? You can see most of these projects target high marsh habitat. That's the red one. And the mix of high marsh and low marsh is the blue one. So you know, really looking at the right habitats and, and how long do people expect before that, um, for that restor those restoration projects to, com to be complete. So um, this is really a way for us to help catalog how far we've come and how far we have to go. And so this whole salt marsh sparrow effort has really been just gaining momentum like crazy. It's almost more than we can handle. It's, it's, it's been so successful. People are so interested in this bird because of all of those values that it carries with it. And, um, you know, in just the last um, three years or so, we've raised more than $3.2 million for salt marsh barrel conservation across the partnership um, through the joint venture. Like we've been applying for multi-state grants that e e have gotten like million dollar grants to do work on testing some of these management actions and a variety of other things. And then it's also become a, high, a highest priority species for the US Fish and Wildlife Service in the Northeast region. This is one of the top priorities of the region. And also a major priority of the states, we have this executive committee that's made up of the direct wildlife directors of each of the states and, and um, leadership within the other federal agencies like, like NOAA and NRCS. Um, it's, and so everyone is kind of working toward these goals um, of reaching a 25,000 bird population goal. Um, funding organizations like National Fish and Wildlife Foundation have also prioritized um, funding for this species in terms of um, through the, the context of coastal resilience. And NGO partners as well are doing a tremendous amount of work on the ground like Audubon. And so the big question which you may be asking yourself is, well, is this going to work? And the answer is we really don't know. Um, a lot of these restoration projects are novel. It's the first time we're, we're doing them on the ground. We haven't had a lot of time to see whether those restoration projects are gonna result in high quality habitat. What we do see is that they are resulting in conversion of vegetation in the direction that it should be going. So those runneling projects move from open water to mud flat, to low marsh vegetation, to high marsh vegetation. And so we are seeing that, but in order to support a salt marsh sparrow, you need a little bit more than that. You need some years of building up a thick thatch layer so that they have you know, all of the components that they need when they're looking for a good place to nest. Not just the flooding regime is restored, but you've got to get the vegetation right too. And even if in a worst case scenario, we fail miserably and the bird goes extinct, which we're really hoping that that's not going to be the case. And I'm feeling optimistic that it won't be because there's so much momentum behind this bird. 
um, the coastal systems are still going to be in a better place than they were because all this work is going into figuring out how to fix this system that is kind of broken right now. And um, the more that we can figure that out, the more quickly we can scale those things up in the right places using the right techniques. And so with that, I am happy to take any questions people have. Amy, thank you very much. That was great. Um, we had a lot of wonderful questions in the chat already that we'll get to in a few moments, but that was wonderful. Um, thanks, everyone. The floor is open for questions. If you have any, please type them into the chat and we'll get to as many as we can with the time that we have left. Um, joining Jillian and I uh, to facilitate the question and answer is Audubon's uh, Connecticut Audubon Connecticut's Director of Conservation and another of my friends and colleagues, uh, Corey Folsom O'Keefe. Hi, Corey. Um, Rich. Corey, you lead Audubon salt marsh restoration efforts on the Connecticut coast. Um, would you like to tell us a little about that before we jump right into the Q&A? Yes, I would. Um, you know, as Amy was talking, she was talking about the, the different strategies that the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture, you know, has recommend to try to increase the resilience of the marsh, of marshes. And um, at the Great Meadows, on Marsh in Stratford, Connecticut, we're actually uh, trying out two of those strategies. Um, so one of them is uh, we're uh, enhancing elevation in areas adjacent to where salt marsh sparrows currently nest um, by sort of creating these mounds or hummocks um, to see if uh, the, maybe the salt marsh sparrows might nest on these, on these mounds and be a little bit less susceptible to flooding. Um, and then we're also, um, Re, uh, sort of reconnecting um, uh, sort of areas where there's pooled water to tidal channels. So it's kind of like runneling, um, but a sort of a slightly larger scale, um, but to uh, again, sort of try to get some of water from uh, this marsh to sort of drain out um, into sort of reestablish tidal flow in and out of the marsh. So um, great to hear some of the things that Amy's mentioning um, are actually taking place in Connecticut and in New York as well. Great, um, so we'll go right into question and answer. Corey, do you wanna start with one? Pitch one to Amy, if you'd like, while you're there. Sure. Um, Put you on the spot. Yeah, you can. Uh, let's see here. Um, well, I know that um, one of the questions that was asked earlier was um, how do upstream dams affect uh, the resilience of a marsh or the health of a marsh? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's one that we kind of explored for a little while a few years ago, um, because it's there are some places where dams are holding back sediment that should be brought to the marsh and display and, and distributed across the marsh surface. And I, we have not, there has not been a comprehensive evaluation of where those dams are. We've had some conversations with some of the some of our partners like with, at USGS um, and, uh, and NOAA about those questions, but no one has really evaluated that yet. But the partners working on the ground, the consensus is that most of the sediment that's needed in a marsh system is coming from the marine environment, not from the riverine environment. That's different depending on where you are in the landscape. You know, West Coast might be different than East Coast, et cetera. Um, but most of the sediment that the marshes need here is coming from um, the, the daily tides and depositing sediment on the marsh from the daily tides. So the, the answer, I guess, is kind of like an unknown right now, but we have kind of decided to move more in other directions because it seems like maybe that's a lesser threat than some of the other things that um, are, are out there that need to be addressed. Uh, there's another question here, Amy, and it's one that I've received um, in the past too, about whether salt marsh sparrows prefer, prefer vast marshes or would they nest and occupy, be successful in smaller marshes? Yeah, they are remarkably resilient and able to nest in small places. Um, you know, I think that if they had a choice, they would probably choose a larger marsh but they're also in like the marshes right outside of New York City. And they're actually doing well in those marshes. Um, and so they, as long as they have the habitat, they can squeeze in almost anywhere. So that's really good for restoration because it's kind of like a, if you build it, they will come kind of a thing. 
Um, they're really good dispersers. They're good at finding little pockets of the right kind of habitat here and there. So if you can create those pockets, even if it's on like a five acre scale, you can still get birds there. Um, definitely better if it's bigger, but they, you know, each of these marshes plays a role in supporting some of these birds. So yeah, they, the, the thing that they, they tend to avoid is, is kind of like this edge kind of thing, like tall, tall things along the edges, like trees, buildings, that kind of thing. They don't really like edges. So the further they are away from, like the angle to the horizon is kind of important. Like they like a flat horizon, ideally. And, and they will go to an area with a flat horizon before they'll go to an area where the first, you know, your angle is to, the, to a tree or something instead of just out across a flat horizon. But they will, they will nest in these small places. They, they're kind of amazing. Thanks, Amy. I've um, got another question, actually, that's uh, from a couple of people. Barbara asks, how can the average citizen help this effort? Somebody else also asked a little earlier, um, how can we volunteer to help? Yeah, um, so, you know, there's obviously, it's, unless you have your own salt marsh in your own backyard, there's not much you can do on the restoration side of things. Um, but there's plenty that you can do to support habitat, you know, like if you, if you're, not familiar with the federal duck stamp program, that's a really great way to invest in marsh restoration and wetland conservation. It's a, the duck stamps are, were historically, you know, they're, you require one for hunting. So all hunters have to buy a duck stamp, but anyone can buy a duck stamp. And if you, and they're, they're beautiful. Like you can have a collection every year. You can get the latest duck stamp. It's a result of a, of an art contest where people paint um, ducks every year. And there's even a little like really fun little Netflix documentary about the duck stamp contest. Um, so that's, that's one way of uh, putting money toward the conservation of wetlands. Um, that is really a program that's doing a lot of good. Like a, a lot of habitat has been bought, bought through the duck stamp. So supporting those kinds of things, supporting your local efforts, supporting if you're in a coastal community ordinances that protect salt marshes and migration areas. Um, is also another good way to work kind of on the local level. Okay, one question. There was actually a question early on about, um, you know, are invasive plant species a, uh, a problem in marshes, um, which I sort of replied that Phragmites can certainly be a problem. Then there was a follow-up question that um, was sort of, uh, does uh, Atlantic Coast Joint Venture recommend uh, including erad eradication of Phragmites in restoration efforts? Yeah, and that's the that's an it depends kind of an answer. So Phragmites is just it's just ubiquitous. It's everywhere, and you could easily spend your whole career battling Phragmites and never get done. Um, so what we are recommending as it relates to Phragmites is focus right now the restoration efforts in the marshes that currently can still support salt marsh sparrows and make them better. And you know, there's still plenty of marsh out there that can support 25,000 birds. And we can just work on those areas and keep them in, a high, in, in high quality or move them that small bit to get them toward high quality. But starting with a Phragmites marsh is a much bigger hill to climb to get to the place of high quality habitat. And it's just a bear to keep up with. So Generally, we recommend the Phragmites management and eradication in the marsh migration zone. That's where you're going to have the most bang for your buck because you're really allowing then the marsh grasses to take hold and move upward. To Otherwise, you'll have this barrier of Phragmites and then the marsh will not migrate. migrate. So that is a really good place to be focusing on, on Phrag control, but generally not in other places. Hey, there's a question about what do the sparrows eat? Oh, good question. They eat a lot of insects. Like you could see, I don't know if you could see from, it might've been a different part of the video. She was coming in and feeding her babies like these massive spiders and crickets and things like that. Um, so they, they eat a lot of insects um, um, and feed a lot of insects to their babies. Hmm. I'm going to add just kind of, I know there's a few people who are saying, oh, how can I, how can I help? How can I help? And uh, for the Great Meadows Marsh Restoration Project that's taking place in Stratford, Connecticut, there is going to be a huge volunteer need um, in the spring. In April and May, um, we have about 150,000 salt marsh grasses that we need to get into the ground. So, um, you know, if you are interested in participating in that volunteer effort, 
I'm sure that um, our communications manager can make sure to send out a link uh, to sign up for updates and to get information about that volunteer effort come the spring. Yeah, the runaling work too often has a big volunteer need. If you have a local runaling project, that is oftentimes just people with shovels and just going out there and shoveling out these really narrow channels and it's kind of satisfying because you can actually watch the water draining out, which is a really kind of satisfying thing to do. Amy, there's a question about um, how when you're approaching, you know, the different stakeholders or people in the community and you want to get support for these types of projects, what kind of resonates in terms of, do you talk more about protection of, you know, the economic benefits um, or storm protection, less birds or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, it, and that's totally determined by the audience. Um, you know, like some audiences, we can talk sparrow conservation until the cows come home and everyone's like jazzed about it. Other audiences, they care more about fish. Like we just had a, a phone call with, no, with uh, NOAA, National Oceanic Administration, gosh. <laughs> I forget how the acronym goes, the two A's <laughs> agency. And they care about fish. And so, you know, they don't care so much about the bird, but if we can make the nexus of removing this culvert to support fish passage is also gonna result in hydrological restoration on the um, salt marsh platform is another angle. Um, we have not had much opportunity to speak to municipalities, but for in those cases, I think the thing that would resonate most is the economic value of protecting communities um, so it, depending on the audience, every audience has different values. And the really cool thing about Salt Marsh Faro is that they hit almost all of those values. So it's really easy to talk about the bird through a number of different lenses. And it's, it's all like totally true and totally solid because this bird represents so solidly so many different values. So another question, this one's a little bit uh, related to the sort of idea of, of marsh migration corridors. Um, are there efforts to expand marshes by getting rid of hardscapes like roads um, and parking lots to allow a marsh to migrate uh, landward? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's possible for sure. I think it takes a lot more work and a lot more money than most people have. Um, so I think projects like that are probably more few and far between. Generally, when we think about marsh migration opportunities, we're looking at places where the landscape is more natural and ideally already open. So like agricultural lands, lawns, those kinds of already open areas where it's pretty easy for marsh grasses to colonize and move upland. It's a lot harder for marshes to move into forested areas. Um, because, you, you know, you've got to kill the trees and then the trees are causing shade and then the trees are causing, you know, issues with looking like they're non-habitat for a sparrow and things like that. And we also don't really know what happens when you cut trees. Do the root balls, do they decompose and create sinking in the marsh platform? Like there's all kinds of like unanswered questions there. So by far the easiest places to focus marsh migration are on these open areas. And thankfully there's still a lot of those left. So um, although it is probably possible to convert a hardscape into a marsh area, I'm not sure that it would be recommended over an easier solution down the road. Amy, there's a few questions that have to um, that are asking about uh, impacts of pesticides, um, and I'm not sure the research that's been done on the impact of, um, or if it's been impacting the sparrow or their young. I don't know. I can't answer that with any any good knowledge. I haven't really done that research. Let me just jump in here and just say we will only have time for about one more question. Um, but if uh, if you have any questions, burning questions that haven't been answered, I will drop into the chat uh, the links to Audubon Connecticut's and Audubon New York's uh, general mailbox. You can email us the question and we'll pester uh, Amy with them after the program um, and make sure that we get back to you. But one more question. This is a pretty simple one, but um, what are the predators of the salt marsh sparrow? Everything. <laughs> Anything that's in a marsh. <laughs>
Um, you know, we, the, the real answer is we don't really know what like the main predators are. There haven't been a lot of studies on that. There have been studies in uh, New Jersey marshes that have shown that predation is actually a greater driver of declines than nest flooding in those areas in New Jersey, but it's not yet clear what the predator community is. And so it's not, that means that it's not really clear how to exclude predators. So likely it's raccoons, it's snakes, it's crabs, it's people have caught deer eating salt marsh sparrow eggs, um, it's avian predators coming from above, it's everything, um, you know, a little morsel of protein in a marsh landscape found by anything that lives there is going to be gobbled up. Great. Well, that's all the time you have. Amy, thanks for joining us today and, and for all you do to uh, help protect that beautiful creature and the suite of birds that uh, also are within that um, habitat, salt marsh. And, and thanks to Jillian and Corey for your participation. And, 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 and Thank you. Um, everyone, Thank we you. hope this for our first webinar next year uh, on January 19th as Rodney Stotts will uh, share his inspiring story about his journey to become a master falconer. So happy holidays, everyone. And thanks again. Thank you.